I'll take it from there. Uh, usual questions are, people often ask, is there going to be a copy of these slides or is this being recorded? I think it's being recorded. Um, just started. Is, just started. Um, and yeah, we can make the slide deck available for those that might find that of some value. So if I kick off, the, the first topic that I'm really going to cover is, is Mike kind of led into this, which is before we dive into you know, the whole topic of client retention and, and you know, attracting new business in, I think one of the first things that I would want to have a look at, and, and certainly comes off some of the new reporting that, that Mike's been involved in, I say within X5, is you know, what metrics are we actually looking at? Uh, what are we tracking? And, and so kind of one of the first questions I would ask, just really, and I appreciate there's a whole raft of issues that come out of, of COVID operationally, but really the main thrust of this morning is around the kind of top line, the revenue line. And so it'd be worth just capturing in your own mind and maybe putting something in the chat, which is, you know, on the revenue line, what's the biggest issue that you guys are seeing at the moment? And, you know, if we can't use COVID kind of as an excuse, it's like, well, you know, many book, many businesses have gone to online booking. Um, maybe uh, I was trying to do something first thing this morning and you were kind of comparing two different businesses offering the same service. One was making it really easy to book online and the other one was making it not only impossible. So it's quite easy to, for me to sit, or certainly as a, as a prospective client of theirs, it's quite easy for me to see which is going to be the easiest one for me to do business with. And they're probably going to be the one that are booked up anyway. So from the point of view, um, stick some stuff in the chat, maybe we can come back to that later on. And I say, I can't deliver and read the chat at the same time, so I rely on Mike for that. Um, but from our point of view, you know, we know the story of the, you know, the Olympic cycling team and marginal, marginal gains. And I think what we're really talking about here is, yeah, you know, they went from a you know, zero medal winning position to kind of pretty much cleaning up. And the point was, it's about finding these points of marginal improvement. Uh, and so it was Matt, I think, was just, I was just talking, I was just talking about his trip over the Atlantic. And I guess that's where your 1% improvements will come on as your, your trip over the Atlantic in 2022. Um, but what are we actually measuring from a revenue perspective? What are we actually looking at? And I think also often businesses are looking at the situation where, okay, what did we do last month? There's the sales figures for last month. Well, that's already happened. So we start to look at this whole concept. And, and if, you've, if you're interested in this topic, then uh, the sources on the bottom of these slides, four disciplines of execution, talk about lead and lag indicators. And I think businesses often focus on those. And I think, you know, given the conversations I've had with Mike over the last few weeks, we see that because we're looking at the, the set of accounts. It's something that's already happened. And these are the outputs. These are things that have already happened. So, okay, I did 100 you know, units of sales last month, but what was it that actually led to that occurring in the first place? So businesses need to start looking at these lead indicators, which are the inputs, which are basically the predictors of what's likely to happen. And if we don't, unless we have some sort of dashboard in place that allows that to be kind of looked at, reviewed, tweaked, et cetera, then we're forever kind of going to be chasing our tail and, and potentially slightly surprised by the result that we got because we weren't putting enough effort potentially at the right things at the beginning. And so kind of bringing this back to a kind of revenue position, which will kind of link to the other two sections that I'm going to cover off. Just take a typical business. You know, here's a business with a revenue line. Uh, it's got a bit of seasonal um, variation in there. And obviously what we've seen at the moment over the last kind of three, four months is that many businesses have found that they've either unfortunately had to close completely so the revenue has dropped or they've found a new baseline. They have a baseline position that they've achieved and now they've got a gap that they need to build up in terms of their future projections. And there's a whole, a whole range of kind of forecasting tools that we've been working with Mike on on that. So if we're looking at the next period of time, and let's say it is the next 12 months, we're going to have some, we're going to have some sales that are going to happen anyway, or they should happen anyway. They should be the underlying recurring business. And that will clearly massively vary by the type of business, the type of service and product that's being provided. But then there's a gap and it's a question of how that gap is addressed. And, and typically, which we'll touch on towards the end of this morning's session is okay, well, to fill that gap, I need to go and attract some new customers. So all of my effort is going to be about attracting new business. I'm going to try to talk to people that I have potentially little or no relationship at the moment. And all we want to do this morning really is just kind of challenge that there might be some other op options there 
before you kind of have to dive into all that kind of brand new client acquisition stuff. So if you look at, um, yeah, if, you, if you've been out and you've been applying for things like civils, loans, you'll have had to produce some sort of business plan for that. Uh, if you've applied for bounce back loans, you certainly don't have to have produced a business plan for that. You may have just fortunately ended up with some money in your, in your bank account, which may be essential for running that business, or it might be that you've applied for a bounce back loan and you've now got you know, some funds available that you could potentially could invest. So, so hopefully some of this might help with that as well. But ultimately the business has got a baseline forecast. And, and what we're going to talk about in the next session is that unless businesses do something, they will lose customers. Businesses on average do lose a number of customers each year. And, and yeah, I'll contest that the average is around about 20%. And we'll talk about that um, shortly. You've also got this added impact at the moment of COVID in that you would have had a forward projection for the business. Um, you'd have ticked some boxes and said, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that particular client is going to be you know, the bank to rights for next year. And unfortunately, now they're in the wrong sector. You know, if, you were in, if you're in the kind of hospitality sector, it's going to be a mess at the moment in terms of forecasting. So there's an impact that brings that down. And then it's a question of well, how, how are we going to build that back up to our theoretical 200 target on here? Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that can be done, which is what am I doing to retain and manage my existing customer base, which is what we're going to talk about in the next session. What am I doing to upsell and cross-sell to that client base? What am I doing to increase frequency and transaction value? And a really big opportunity, which we'll talk about, is this whole area of referrals. And there's a, so there's a, yeah, there's four green boxes there of activity that can be undertaken. I, I would argue or contest before we need to be starting to spend money on what we might call pure marketing, talking to people who don't know us and we're now competing against everybody else. And that's, if you like, our kind of pure lead generation. So if you look at it this way, you could turn around and say, well, okay, well, what have we got? We've got past relationships, we've got businesses um, or customers that have worked with us in the past, which are no longer with us for some reason or another. And we'll talk about that shortly in terms of how we can mitigate that and if that will bring some of those back on. We've got current customers where there's a whole raft of opportunities around cross sell, upsell, et cetera, and, and building that lifetime value, the LTV. We've got referrals, which should come from that client base and could come from other and should be coming from other contacts as well. And we know that they are they're, they're certainly easier to sell to, they buy more stuff, whatever that stuff might be, and, and they hang around longer. And then at the other end, we've got the kind of those that were that are unknown to us at the moment, which is our pure lead gen. And, and the kind of graphic there is kind of indicating, depending on your market, it's either double to eight times more expensive to kind of manage and deal with a new client than it is to manage and deal with an existing client. So what we're really kind of putting across this morning is, of all the activity we've got to undertake, and I appreciate, you know, below the revenue line, there's a whole bunch of operational stuff that needs to go on, and that must be an absolute nightmare in many businesses at the moment. If we're just looking at that top line, is where should we focus the, the effort and resource across this whole spread of activity? So if you look at it from the point of view in terms of kind of some top line stats, just to bear in mind, which we'll come back to at the end, which is the quoted average in terms of client attrition in the UK is around about 20%. And this was pre-COVID. Now we can we can debate or we could debate whether that is right for a particular business. But when you're sat with a number of uh, an aggregate number of businesses in the room, you kind of end up back at this average. Does that mean that we're having to replace our entire client base every five years? No, no, of course it doesn't. Yeah, you know, if you imagine you've got your stack, your Jenga stack there. And those are your clients. Well, the bottom of that is going to be pretty solid, but there's typically going to be quite a lot of churn at the top. And some of that you can control and some of you can't. The other thing that we'll move on to as well is that lots of businesses ask for feedback. And, and obviously where we specialize is around this whole area of client engagement. We all get asked for feedback, but we know that many, many businesses that you know, we're engaged with as a customer, as it were, don't do anything with it. Um, you yeah, know, we spend our time and effort, you know, complying with those requests, but we don't do anything with the, the, the businesses, don't do anything with what comes back. And I say just this whole kind of mindset is to making sure that the business is getting a return on investment for effort. And, and by effort, I mean, regardless of size, if it's a larger organization, it's going to have a sales force, it could have a sales team out there, 
if it's a small operator, it could be just the individual and it's their time. But it's their resources, their time, their money, whatever it might be. And it's just forming that balance. And again, we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail. So kind of linking back to a couple of points that Mike made at the beginning, for the rest of this kind of topic, I'm just going to cover off kind of nine business levers. They're going to be known to you. That this isn't rocket science, but I suppose what I'm just trying to get across to you is just have a think within your organization. Is this relevant and are we tracking it as a potential um, lead indicator to something that we want to achieve in the longer term? So I'm just going to kind of talk through those um, briefly. So the, the nine that I'm, I'm kind of focused on here, and there's a clear, as I say, as we go down the balance sheet and the profit and loss, there are other factors that come into play, but you know, leads, conversion, transaction values, margin, frequency of purchase, upsell, cross-sell, retention and referrals. That's the bit that we're talking about, and that then leads into the, the other two topics that I'm going to cover off. So from a lead generation perspective, um, have you looked at, is the business looking at its lead sources? Is it looking at the quality of those lead sources? And does it really understand yeah, the cost, the real cost of each of those leads that's being generated? And often we're talking to businesses, and again, I have to talk broadly because yeah, we've got a very broad range of businesses in here. And if there's anything in specifics in terms of the questions, by all means, we can do that on the Q&A, or we can pick it up afterwards. But broadly speaking, businesses don't track their cost of acquisition. And, they, and that starts with, do they really understand what the cost of this particular lead is? Whether that's coming from social media, a click, somebody historically knocking on doors, somebody making telephone calls, you know, telemarketing, it's very easy to track the actual cost. And sometimes it's quite horrific, the cost of telemarketing, for example, um, when you actually start to break down what's coming off the back of it. You're then looking at conversion. So what's my conversion rate? And again, do businesses track that? Do they really understand? We, we've, we talk about this later on, but ultimately, you know, we've spoken to businesses where they say, well, we go out and we do our customer call, whatever that engagement piece is. We've done the customer call. We've done the customer visit. We've done the site survey. Um, and we haven't heard anything come back. So therefore, we've lost that. So that was a, you know, that was a zero on our metric. Well, but you've put no follow-up in to understand... What was the purpose of that discussion? Were they, are you in a competition with other suppliers? Uh, were they just fishing for a price and it wasn't really a serious uh, inquiry? Were they trying to understand a bit more the products or service, understand the budget, and it might be something that they've had to put in there to their sale, sorry, their budgeting for, for the next period, the next year. If you don't understand any of those elements or haven't asked those particular questions, then you can't really track what your actual conversion rates are. Um, we'll talk about that in a second in terms of, you know, businesses often give up way too early in terms of following up on a lead and, and by leads, I mean in kind of referral opportunities that have been passed to them as well. We've then got uh, transaction values in terms of, you know, again, many, many businesses have moved to online booking systems over the last period, it's obviously in some cases making it a lot easier to do business with them. They've kind of had to jump quite quickly to kind of new technology. But this whole kind of transaction value, well, what are we doing here? Are we, how are we making it, uh, are we making it easy for people to buy our product and service? Are we putting them on flexible terms? We're seeing quite a lot of this online at the moment where it's, you know, it's this price, but you can get it interest free on, on you know, these easy payment terms. Now, I suggest you should be heading into additional credit but again, are we making those those decisions easier? Yeah, you know, with with on big capital purchases, it's often a yes. I can't afford that number, so that's a yes or no answer. But if I could give you options in terms of how that's spread, or how it's paid, then maybe I might get a better solution. In terms of profit margin, you know, many businesses don't track this. And okay, as we go down to you know. Net, net profit but just at gross level you know what are we selling this product for and what is it actually costing and again when you get into the analysis we often see this kind of long tail businesses are making as a classic 80 20 businesses are making 80 percent of their profit for 20 percent of the products and there's a big chunk of products in that tail that they're actually losing money on when they actually do the calculation certainly if it's product that they're manufacturing themselves clearly if they're buying it in then they've got a little bit more control and visibility over you know the cost equation if they're in a manufacturing or production type business, that, that it, 
it's quite surprising often that you know they'll they'll go up to a profit number and then they'll realize if they actually do the analysis together with something that mike was talking about at the beginning that there's a whole chunk of products they're just losing money on and they can argue to the cows going that you know it's part of a portfolio and if we didn't have those we wouldn't sell this and okay there might be some argument to some of that but often a lot of this is kind of historic positioning and businesses just need to look at their product range and say look do we actually really need all of this is it making our life more complicated than it, than it should be frequency of purchase uh, what can be done to increase that in certain markets it might be fairly fixed but again i'm going to give you an example in a second of yeah again you can use this kind of analysis to say well what should it be in my marketplace or what is it for my current client bank does that mean that they're really active or not or actually are there historic customers which are just still sat on our books uh, and what can we do to slightly nudge the frequency or slightly improve or reduce the frequency period such that they're buying more each, each kind of calendar year or whatever the right period is Clearly, yeah. if they're big capital projects it can be a different argument but often there, there are angles here where we can get products sold more frequently upselling around again i know they appreciate this is obvious but often businesses don't have a sufficiently broad spread of product in that you have a group of customers who are prepared to pay a certain price for what you do and they love what you do and they they talk you know, lovingly about your product there will be a small but probably quite large niche that are prepared to pay quite a hefty premium for your service um, i'm not a big follower of football but the example that you could probably get your head around is you know if i was a follower of a football team or whatever it might be i'm in a small niche that's prepared to pay for a box prepared to pay for foreign travel to see absolutely everything i'm a high spender in relation to that particular product or it might be somebody that's got a very low budget and has got you know a few key rings and a piece of merchandise they're all fans of that particular product their spend capability is massively different and often businesses don't realize that there are some real advocates for what they do but they don't service those real advocates needs and they would actually spend a bit more money so come that's where we're coming from or where i'm suggesting you might have this kind of super premium offering kind of classic, classic cross-selling you know are we is I'm, i use the word script loosely but is it scripted are we consistently asking for that opportunity mm -hmm. of, a, of a cross sell you bought this do you want this to go with it you know it's kind of classic on you know amazon or wherever it might be customers who bought this also bought this with it as well and are we missing out on opportunities there in terms of often we see this where large product or the yeah, large bits of kit are put in or there's an installation job done or something like that and the business is missing out on the whole area of uh, annual servicing we've seen this many many times with business yeah, they're, they're a great company they did a fantastic project installation of whatever it might be but yeah we get somebody else to do the annual servicing on this because they never mentioned it um businesses often too often assume that the client or prospect that they're talking to fully understands everything they do and of course they'll ask if they want that stuff and that's just about having a checklist or script or whatever's appropriate in that particular market just to re sorry to interrupt there Matt, uh, of course, Dan, just to, just to uh, reinforce that i mean the other thing the the interesting the the, the fast food example you've just given is one that i often give where yeah. somebody says you know 70 70 pence would you like to go large sort of thing and if you actually think about it what you get is kind of you generally get a little bit more wrapper, a couple of yeah. chips and like three ice cubes. So the reality of it is it's generally very high margin stuff that you can huge. you can do in that process as well. Yeah, absolutely huge. Yeah, I was a holiday with the kids and there's that kind of classic, do you want a larger or small hot chocolate? Yeah, 50p difference. What am I actually getting for that? Yeah, not a lot. That, as you say, a bit more froth and a few more marshmallows and there must be massive margin on that. Um, customer retention I'm going to talk about uh, in the in kind of in the next topic area but again businesses don't track this they they have sometimes they're slightly deluded in their numbers in terms of well they're they're active customers because we sold something to them yeah, but when did you last sell something to them what would you expect that frequency to be uh, if they're on annual renewal of contract then how secure is that annual renewal of contract again we're going to touch on that as well this is what we were talking to somebody yesterday that sold merchant services and they you know fair play they try and sign businesses up to a three-year contract 
and it's this whole conversation around if I've made a decision to purchase something and I've paid a supply some money, I want to feel good about that decision. So at that moment in time, unless something goes badly wrong, I'm kind of very kind of positive about what happened. So if I'm asked my opinion at that point, I'm more than likely to give a positive response. Again, unless the kind of onboarding process has fallen over. If I'm in mid contract or something, then ultimately I've either used it and it's gone well, and I think I made the right decision or I haven't used it or I've used it and it's gone badly. And I'm thinking, hmm, should I have signed up to this? Is this, is this now more expensive than I thought it was going to be? So I'm going to be kind of in a different position. And then as I'm heading towards end of contract, potentially up for renewal, I, you know, if, if other companies have done their job, whether they know that I'm up for renewal and therefore they're going to be touting for my business. So there's, there's points of interaction that companies should be looking at in terms of contract timing in terms of when they should make sure that they're engaging with their customers. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail. And then there's, there's a huge, huge opportunity um, around referrals, again, which I'll talk about in a second. But ultimately, is this bit, the purpose of this bit is, is this being tracked? And we see time and time again, there's a massive referral opportunity, which is why I deliberately put that as kind of, kind of quite a big block on my graph earlier on, which is business has the opportunity, they just don't ask. They feel uncomfortable about asking or they don't know how to ask. They think it's being pushy. Um, and there are ways and means of managing that, which I think would make life an awful lot easier for people. So yeah, it's about tracking those referral opportunities. We don't, we don't know whether we've got them or not. Um, and having some sort of you know, productive and proactive process in place and understanding who those partners might be. Because often we talk about referrals being, they've got to have, that person's got to use our service or our business to understand us well enough to offer referral. But that's often not the case. So who are these partners? So I've just covered off those kind of nine topics relatively quickly. Um, and so the kind of suggested at the end of each one, I just kind of put a couple of well, a few suggested actions. Clearly, businesses, yeah, if they've applied for funding, et cetera, they've had to update their forecast. So yeah, we've got to have a look at forecasts because we need to know what we're aiming for. We need to understand what our lead and lag measures are. So we need to create some form of dashboard around that. And this is not about, you know, spending hours and hours managing a dashboard because that's our internal navel gazing. But if you've got a team of people, they need to know what they're targeting or what they're heading for. And they also need to, be, need to know what they're going to be held accountable for at the end of the day. I think this is whole revenue risk assessment. What by that, what I mean is, okay, we did a, we've done a forecast. We did it based on last year. We know our customer, a couple of our customers are in trouble. So we've taken them out or whatever, we've downgraded them. But have we had a really robust look at that? Are we being true to ourselves about what those numbers should be? And if we've actually had some good funding recently, off the back of a revenue projection, which has obviously got some sort of payback on that loan or whatever it might be, then we need to be quite secure in that. And okay, we can kick that down, down the road for 12 months and worry about it obviously when the repayments, whatever might kick in. But ultimately that time is going to come and there's, there is a time period here I think where that could be you know, properly looked at and I, I suppose the last element of that to that again which we'll touch on in a second which is you know, of our marketing effort and by that our own personal time or the time of the team or the fact that we've outsourced it to somebody else what's that returning um, and are we getting the right results from it so that's me wrapping up the first topic so I don't know whether there's any kind of questions at all. I don't know whether there's anything in the chat log like, and if I'm, I'm just buying a bit of time now so that I can switch presentations over. <laughs> no, there's basically people have been saying that uh, it's question. That a lot of people are really busy. Um, it's a question of just trying to uh, um, have they got help? Have they got the resources? Simon made an interesting one: is uh, um, do we take a chance recruiting, or do we sit tight? So it's like that old thing where you. Um, do you at the present time invest in new resources? I mean, I saw a local solicitor um, saying how fantastic his growth had been. And I thought, he's a brave man. He's taken on so many, so many new solicitors. Um, hope the business is there. And it's, uh, I think so. It's actually all quite positive uh, out there yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from anybody else at all? If not, I will move on to, I'll move on to the next one. Would be how to how to identify that uh, that client that customer who 
potentially would be prepared to spend more with you. Okay, that, that's brilliant. That's a good lead in. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So okay. I'll let me put this up. Make sure. Okay, so hopefully you can see a screen with topic two on there. Uh, Thomas, if I haven't answered your question by the end of this, then we'll we'll pick it up again. So topic two, protecting sales and referrals. So this is about what are we doing with our existing customer base? And I'm using the word customer, client, entertain interchangeably. You may have patients. If you're a charity, you may have donors. So it's this, whoever it is, is giving you something, whether it's time, cash for a product or whatever it might be. And so the question here is around when did, when did you or your business last engage with your customers? So we've had situations where we've had dialogue with people saying that, yeah, it was, if you kind of chunk it down over the last four stroke five months, during this lockdown period. First part of it, we all had the same issues. We were all dealing with our own personal stuff and you know, trying to keep our businesses afloat and all that kind of good stuff. Then it kind of, every, everything started to kind of wake up slightly and people were, we knew where they were, they were mainly at home um, and they were actually quite contactable. Yet we've still spoken to business and if you've got hundreds or thousands of clients who are kind of subscription-based business, it would obviously be a different story. But many businesses have, have got enough clients that they could pick and choose and actually pick up the phone and have a conversation not to try and sell something but just have a conversation about how their business is and ultimately what you're trying to do is answer that initial question which is kind of which box should i put you in how secure do i think this relationship might be and when would be a good time to pick you up but that's one question i would put you know when did you and and are, having asked the question do we feel comfortable with our response and if we do then then that's great so I, as I said earlier on, yeah, this was from some work that was actually done around GDPR. So this is kind of from a couple of years ago, and this is why it's got a very specific number on from the Royal Mail. But the point here is that a business on average will lose around about 20% of their clients. We can argue that and say, my business, that's not, it's not that number. It might be 5%. But we've actually done an aggregate of this over a number of different types of business, and we've seen figures as high as 40. So it varies. But let's stick with the 20%. The issue for most, most businesses, they don't know who they are because they haven't had that conversation. They assume that we're on a level playing field. So do we know who they are? And we hope that if they are gonna go, that there might be someone there that we would happily lose because they're, they're high pressure on us, they're high cost of service, they're a nightmare to deal with, and actually we'd be quite happy if they went somewhere else. Um, but unfortunately, probably in there might be some of our high profit customers as well. And we don't know. The other angle we've got on this, unfortunately, with, with COVID is some of those businesses that we thought were stable are just not going to be there anyway. Just they're in the wrong sector. And unfortunately, they're not going to make it through so nothing they did wrong. But again, so we've got this impact that comes through, which goes back to the kind of first graph I would share. So one of the things you might off the back of this want to talk to, to Mike about, if, if not already, is that there's a customer exception report that we can now run. Um, and we're looking at that for a couple of Mike's clients at the moment in terms of how many customers have you lost in the last 12 months? How many have you gained? And what's the gap look like? Because ultimately, if a business is losing more customers than it's gaining, and it's still putting in an awful lot of effort on marketing, we've got a problem somewhere. And, and the, the kind of simplest story on this one I can kind of tell you is, and this is kind of a true story, talking to a corporate stationary supplier, um, and we're having this conversation about how many active customers they've got, which goes back to your purchase frequency discussion that we were having earlier on. So we offer great customer service, and we're really proud, yeah, owner managed business, uh, we've got 850 live customers. That's fantastic, well done. Um, Let's just have a little play with this because it'll be in your number somewhere. Would it be fair to, how often on average would you expect someone to purchase your product? Monthly seems reasonable for this particular sector. So would it be fair to assume that if a business hasn't purchased from you in the last quarter, in the last three months, that they may, either, well, they've either gone out of business or they're buying that product from somewhere else. Yeah, that would be a fair assumption. Okay, well, on that analysis, you've got 250 customers. And all of a sudden it goes very quiet. And you go, what does that actually mean? So if I was in a business that uh, I was running this business and I was potentially looking to exit and I'm telling a story that I've got, the column on the left, 
but my reality in the numbers is a column on the right. I've got a very different, very, very different situation coming into play. So again, how you might run this analysis within your own organization, there's going to be some level of metric that you can look at, say, what do we think is a reasonable purchase frequency? And it'll be in the numbers because it's, yeah, because it will be on, yeah, in terms of your online um, accounts packages. So we then look at why customers leave. Um, again, depending on the size of your business, if you have a sales team, uh, I've been in a sales team, I've managed sales teams, good excuse we would come out with, well, everyone else was cheaper. That's, what, that's why we lost this particular customer. Yeah, okay, could be a good excuse. But when the analysis is done, the vast percentage of these is because there's a perception of indifference. There's a perception that the relationship between the supplier and the customer has broken down. It's not resolved. So to my mind, something could have been done about some of those. The next biggest chunk is the service issue. So an unresolved service issue. So now we're looking at kind of 80 odd percent of the reasons why customers leave is something that the supplier potentially could have done something about. I'm not saying they could have rescued all of those, but probably a good chunk. And then if you follow the graph round, you end up with kind of 9% on price and then a whole bunch of really small reasons such as them closing down, going out of business, being sold to you know, their next nearest competitor, whatever it might be. So again, this is whole kind of perception of, well, let's look at, let's do some analysis about the clients that we have unfortunately lost on why, do we understand why they went, genuinely understand why they went? And let's be true to ourselves about that. We then kind of look at it the other way around and say, well, why don't customers buy more stuff? Um, and just to give you a bit of context where this comes from is uh, a lot of the work that we do is about client satisfaction. And our insight is gained by conducting telephone interviews with the business clients on their behalf. So we're kind of acting as a third party to find out kind of what's going on. I'm going to walk you through an example of that in a second, but this is kind of a bit of an aggregate of what comes back. And it doesn't really matter, to be honest, what type of business or service it is. These are kind of fairly consistent things that come through, which is around, you know, how I'm being communicated to as a, as a, as a customer, uh, clarity of, clarity of communications but a lot comes through in terms of clarity of proposals for example i'm a customer you've come and talked to me about a potential new solution uh it was probably done over over zoom now um i was very clear about what i thought this kind of scope of work was going to be and now i've got a proposal i can't make head nor tail of it, and i need to go and sell this up the line or i need to be clear in my own mind and you've not made it clear to me what the bundle of activity is, pricing's not clear. And we see this coming back an awful lot in terms of just a misunderstanding and miscommunication. What's been quite interesting on that front is an increased number of businesses are now, here's your, yeah, if you are in that kind of situation, here's your kind of proposal, which I appreciate could be literally a, an email or it could be quite a large document. Here's your proposal, here's a two minute Zoom video or Loom video, or whatever it might be, just explaining the key points of that. And that seems to be working quite well. So just about clarity of communication. Time scales, a lot of time scale service delivery. We're seeing more and more of that at the moment. We, yeah, we've all no doubt been on hold recently to the bank, to HRC, to whoever it might be saying, yeah, unfortunately due to current COVID, yeah, okay, I get it as a business, but that started four or five months ago. You're in a new reality now in terms of how you manage those calls. So. Again, I don't know about yourself. Some businesses I'm ringing you know, as a customer, yeah, you are in a queue. You're in a long queue, but at least I know I'm in a queue and I know that number's counting down. I was at position 200 and I'm now at 30 and I know I'm making progress. But when you ring yeah, the bank, HMRC, whoever it might be, you're in a loop of death. You don't know how long you're gonna be on that phone call and you don't know when they're gonna press that button and you're gonna be cut off. So again, just think about it in the context of your own business is how is that kind of customer expectation being managed? And then there's this whole thing about many businesses of kind of looking at their relationships and hand have gone the extra mile during this period. A bit of goodwill obviously goes a long way, but clearly, yeah, we've all got bills to pay. Um, but this whole thing, you know, yeah, they go the extra mile. People do appreciate that. And it's a question of just that balance in terms of what that extra mile costs everybody. But ultimately, we capped this under managing expectations. Yeah, if a business is managing its customer expectations well, 
that relationship will largely be maintained. And quite at the moment, a lot, to my mind, a lot of this is around service delivery. Yeah, we said we would get you whatever this by tomorrow. Oh, but due to COVID, because that's now a catch-all excuse, potentially, it's going to be another two weeks. Well, were you true to me in the first, were you yeah, being truthful to me in the first place? But if it's going to be a couple of days late, tell me it's going to be a couple of days late and I can manage around that scenario. So there's this whole element of man just managing expectations. And again, just do you feel within your organization that that's being kind of closely looked after? And the other element to this is, yeah, you know, this whole area of hidden issues in terms of let's classify them as customer complaints or customer issues. And, and the, the stat here is, yeah, well, we don't get many customer complaints, so we must be doing okay. Well, obviously with the advent of social media, they don't necessarily need to complain to you. They can complain to the world without even telling you about it. So the stat here is showing that for every customer complaint that's kind of flagged, there is a big number that the business is not aware of. And the kind of the yeah, classic iceberg analogy, and whether it's one in 26 or whether it's one in 10, it doesn't really matter. It's, there is a number. There is a number that you as a business don't know about because they, you know, you, either you've made it difficult to make that comment come through or you keep not to respond or they can't be, it's not such a big issue to them that they're going to take their time to kind of go through a complaints process with yourself. But they're going to start telling their friends, they're going to start talking about our social media, whatever. So again, just think about it in that context. And also, as I mentioned earlier on, this whole balance bit between looking after new existing customers versus new client acquisition, which we'll talk about in the next session. It just does cost more at the end of the day. And so it's just being mindful of that. I think the other aspect, which was was part of the question that was was asked was, yeah, how does how do you as an organization assess levels of satisfaction? And that could be, well, we don't, to we do an annual survey, to we make telephone calls or we outsource it or whatever it might be, but how do you do it currently? And the issue is, is that often when people, I was talking to somebody that does online surveys as a service to businesses yesterday, and thankfully they were backing up my stats, which was quite good, which is if you do an online survey, your typical response rate is around about 30%. So who's responding? Is it everybody on this spread, this five point scale here, or is it typically the ones at either end? Because I'm motivated to tell you, if I think you're brilliant, I might go out of my way to tell you that I'm, you're brilliant and I'll fill out your form or I'll, or I'll respond to your email request. But equally, you've got the other end, which will go, I think you're an absolute nightmare to deal with and I am going to tell you about it. And I've already told all my friends, but I'm now going to tell you about it because you've asked. But what you tend to find is you've got this rather large silent majority in the middle that can't, you know, they're ambivalent and are not going to, resp typically they don't respond. So now as a business, you're looking at a kind of 30% which is an average of either end and not really the picture that sat in the middle. So you, ultimately your silent majority are, okay, well, I know what my delighted clients are saying. I know what my, let's say less delighted, upset, extremely angry clients might be saying, but I still don't really have a view of this group in the middle. And what might they be saying about your business? And so ultimately you've got this scenario of, well, I'm not getting many customer complaints or issues being flagged, isn't it? Returns, whatever that's being measured. And my feedback scores seem okay because it's an aggregate, it's an average of two extremes. But we've all been in this situation where when a supplier asks the customer direct, the customer is not always 100% truthful about what they really think because we tend not to want to have a great debate about it. Um, but we probably won't repeat our purchase. So it's again, this kind of thought process of how, where are we finding this data from and, and kind of how are we interpret it. So just kind of walk through an example which to, to try and embed this slightly, which is, this is an example of an interview that we did with a professional services provider. Um, so we're ringing their customer on their behalf. And one of the, you know, the questions are around kind of, well, what stands out about the service you received from this supplier? And so here is the, the, the response that they gave to us. And this is say a telephone conversation really positive so okay there's some stuff in there that we could really use that business could really use for creating a testimonial or a case study or whatever it might be that comes off the back of it. they want more of this to be positive. there's some really useful information there. 
In fact, I'm prompted. They said I would recommend them and I would continue to do so. Or I couldn't really ask for anything more than that, to be honest. Um, so our next question is, would you recommend them? Well, they've actually already offered that up. So they said, yes. Okay, brilliant. We'll talk about referrals in a second. We then would have asked them something along the lines of, on a five-point scale, how would you score them in relation to service delivery, perceived value, how helpful they are, and the quality of the communications? At which point, they would have come back with a spread of scores. Okay, if they think they're very helpful and they think they're okay on communications and services, they've kind of given them a slightly lower um, value score. Well, okay, on a five-point scale, three out of five is average, isn't it? So are we are we happy with that scoring? So all I'm asking you to do here is really, if you have got some feedback scores or you've looked at this as a business, just be true to yourself in terms of how you're interpreting that data, because often we go, you know, we're we're okay with that, we're okay with kind of average. Just show you this piece of research that was done, which you know on a five point scale. So if you're if you're a business that's using or is familiar with Net Promoter Score, it's the same concept, just double the numbers. Um, we'll give it a scale from satisfied to dissatisfied. Okay, well, let's change that from how engaged they are to how disengaged they are with you as a supplier. At the very engaged end. They're what they call the zone of um, zone of affection. They will promote your business. They would probably go out of their way to tell somebody else looking for your service that actually they, that, that you should be. They should take the opportunity to try you out. They've done a great job. Fantastic. We've then got this four out of five, which are indifferent. Um, thanks very much. You've done exactly what you said you would do as a supplier. I'm actually going to go out of my way to promote you as a business. Um, but but thanks very much. We've then got quite a large group at the end, which is what they call the detractors, which are somewhere in the mix of on the move. And this, this kind of stacks up against the NPS score as well. But the point here is that they're out telling people and certainly on a one stroke two, yeah, they would interrupt somebody having a conversation. say, over here, you're looking for a supplier of this particular service. Well, I, would, I wouldn't touch X with a barge pole because well, it might be because that they have heard they have worked directly with that supplier and it was a nightmare. Or more as likely might be that they've heard that they're a bad supplier and they're a nightmare and they don't want somebody to make the same mistake. So this whole thing about kind of reputation management, which we're going to talk about in the in the next section, kind of comes into play. And some of this you just yeah, with the advent of yeah, we're old enough to to remember pre-social media uh, when none of this was as much of an issue um but with the advent of social media it's just way way too easy for this to kick off um and you know a disgruntled client that you know was an absolute nightmare um can just cause all sorts of headaches so it's just being sensitive to how all of this kind of stuff is being managed i appreciate it, it does vary from different businesses does this scoring really matter? Um, this was from the UK. There's an index that's done every 12 months. And so effectively what they were saying here is in terms of if I score you, I'm your customer and I score you five out of five uh, or nine and 10 out of 10, my intention to remain and likelihood to recommend they're in the kind of high, they're in the 90s. If that score just drops down to a four, so we're now kind of seven and eight out of 10, um, the scores drop off significantly. So it backs up that original yeah, five point scale. So again, I'm just contending, just be mindful if you're looking at, if you haven't got any feedback scores, maybe get some. Um, but if you are looking at feedback scores that you've had in the past, just maybe take another look at that and say, okay, how does that reflect based on this kind of information? Because if we go back to the first question we asked this particular client, it was all very positive. It's all great stuff we could use. It was nice, but it was also really useful. We could do something with this. Um, nice ones are, yeah, I think they're great. Well, I, that's nice to hear, but I can't do anything with it. It's not useful content. But when we asked them, yeah, how could they improve based on the fact that yeah, good, con good, con uh, good content at the beginning, they said they would recommend them. They've given some okay scores, to be fair. Um, but how, well, actually, now we're digging into, there's some comments here that are making me feel slightly less comfortable. So does that mean that I've got them in the bank, if you like, for next year as revenue? But if I read this, are they? Um, and I think what we're looking at here is that a well-timed intervention, not businesses read stuff like this and they go, oh, right, 
um, they think we're too expensive, we need to talk to them about our pricing. Or I'm really annoyed by this because we've bent over backwards to help this particular client and they still think that we're expensive or whatever, whatever this story is. It's like, well, no, there's a discussion here that's, that thanks them for their feedback because it was positive. Thanks them for the referral opportunity and follows it up. Thanks them for the scoring and tackles this head on by saying, let's have a conversation, obviously not quite this way. Let's reposition our value. Let's reassert what we're actually doing for them and why they're paying what they're paying and reset a line in the sand that we've just had a conversation. So the more frequent discussion goes away. Uh, don't read into this is a bigger issue than it actually is. Businesses get quite defensive when they read this stuff. It's like one phone call, this whole thing would probably go away. Um, and there might even be an opportunity to upsell. We see that quite a bit with these comments, which is there's a mismatch between the supplier and the client in terms of what they both think they're delivering. And, and sometimes you end up in a situation where you can upsell them to a different package. Or the client comes back and says, uh, it'd be really great if supplier X did X, Y, and Z. And the supplier goes, well, we do do all of that. And it's all over our website. It's like, yeah, but your customers don't go reading the website. You need to make sure that you're communicating with them at the appropriate point. Or they come back with things like this and you've done a batch of these calls and you find out that there's a slightly consistent theme of more frequent discussion, let's say. It's so like, what is your intervention point, which goes back actually to Thomas's point at the beginning, which is having this dialogue starts to understand where the actual revenue is. The other point I would implore here is if you're, not, if you're going to ask, do something with the information because the stats again show that loads of businesses asked for feedback and they didn't do anything with it at all. So only one in 20 actually go back to the client, say thank you very much for what you did. You took time out to do this and follow up in an appropriate way. And there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that can come out of the back of that. Um, yeah, most businesses don't even brief it internally. It gets stuck in a drawer. I was even having that conversation again yesterday with, with a company that says, we had a fantastic piece of customer comment came in, um, you know, off, off, you know, off the back of them. There was such an advocate, they just sent it in. We all read it and we didn't know what to do with it. Oh, there's a whole load of stuff you could do with it, like stick it on social media or on your website or something in your proposals. Just going to touch on this because again, it actually leads from the question that was asked. And I, again, I know, um, I don't know you as a, as a group, um, and I appreciate some of this is really obvious, but we get asked about this, which is just do a gap analysis because the clients come back and say, well, yeah, um, no, there's nothing else they could do for us. They did a really good job and there's nothing else they could do for us. And I go, really? Yeah, you've got a list of um, services that you supply. Does your customer really understand? It might be that there is nothing you could do, but do they really understand the whole gamut of your service operation and, and the opportunity that you can provide to them? Um, and was that ever discussed? Well, no, because they only ever asked about product or service A. Or is there now the time to talk about B, C, and D? Well, I don't know. Well, have you asked them? So, you know, kind of classic, very simple, A matrix. And again, there is a report that I know Mike's team can produce that effectively is doing this because a lot of people will talk to them and say, look, I think you've got an opportunity within your existing client base. It's probably 20 to 30 percent revenue with that within that client bank if you do this, this process. And they'll kind of go off and they'll say, right, we're going to segment our clients. We're going to produce a spreadsheet. We're going to kind of map who's buying what. And then we'll identify the gaps, which is effectively what I'm showing on the screen here. Well, I know Mike. Um, and his team can produce that relatively uh, yeah, straight off the, off the accounts package, basically. So, okay, keeping it simple, this is our current, you know, customers, customer one is buying services one, two, and four. Okay, so we've got some, we've got some gaps here where we turn around and say, actually, we know customer one, we have had the conversation, those products aren't, the rest of our products and services are not relevant to them that will be a waste of time having that conversation. So now we've got, well, are, are these all opportunities? Okay, well, let's take another look at this. We turn around and say, do you know what? Customer six, they are a real nightmare to, to, to work with. We, we shouldn't really have brought them in. They're really high cost of service. And actually, we're going to leave it. If we put them in a holding situation, and that's the right thing to do for them. And then it's a question of, okay, well, let's take another look at it again and go, 
well actually product and service four is a bit of a headache to deliver we wish we hadn't done it or it has got high cost or it's low margin or something so let's leave that so now we're starting to narrow down where we should focus and there's a there's normally a wealth of opportunity around just running this process and it can be done relatively it can be done relatively quickly it can literally be done on a pack packet if we still think but uh there's various ways that that can be done but it can be automated so if you talk about referrals, um, which comes off the back of, we run a piece of analysis, we run an audit, and I would say that on, by and large, kind of 80 to 90% of clients come back, say, yeah, we'd recommend them. And these haven't been handpicked. In fact, that example I showed you, they've got some, in quotes, issues, which they flagged at the end, but they were still very happy to recommend that business. So we know that these clients will recommend. The issue is often that the business doesn't know what its ideal referral looks like and hasn't kind of eloquently put that forward. And the other big issue um, is businesses don't ask. So that's, this is an old stat, but it's borne out by all the work that we do and just the kind of day-to-day -day conversations we have, which is the vast majority of your clients say they would recommend you. What are you doing about following that up? And they go, well, yeah, but we're, send, we're, we're too busy sending out email campaigns from MailChimp. Okay, that's fine. You should do that appropriately. But what about these customers that we spoke to or you spoke to two weeks ago? You said, yeah, we think you do a great job. And yes, we would recommend them. What have you done about that? Yeah, but that's, that's too difficult. Well, it's not really difficult. It's just a question of having an appropriate conversation. So, you know, trying to keep this really simple is that what what are we say who is saying it and who are we saying it to and what are we actually saying and this people say well when should, what's the right timing to ask and how should we ask and there is a process for this so one of the things again i'll follow up with mike in terms of how we get this information to you um for this chat phil jones um there's the video on youtube which we can send you that we'll get you a link to it's it's a script but it follows a natural flow of conversation. It would naturally suit most businesses and obviously would be tweaked for most businesses, but it's a very simple, I think a very simple process that can be followed and you know, credit to, to him. So that, that's where this came from. But you know, it's, you've got to ask the question. Businesses just don't ask, you know, thank you for your feedback. Uh, that was really nice to hear, blah, blah, blah. We'd like to make a case study out of that. Part of that case study would actually promote your business as well. Is that okay? Yeah, of course that's okay, right? So okay, we've got down that process. We put it out on social media or whatever is appropriate. Uh, Notice you said you'd recommend us. That's that's great. That's fantastic. Thanks very much. Just go through these kind of feedback suggestions that you've given us, um, and we'll come up with. All right, okay. Now cut to. We've written up a case study. We've gone back and said, look, here's the case study about your business and. You're the hero of the piece. It talks about you and your business and what you're doing and just how we're supporting you as an organization or as a supplier. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I'm loving all of this as, 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 the, as the client as it were. Um, yeah, just recall that yeah, earlier on, in, you mentioned that you'd be happy to give us a recommendation. You know, could you think of just one person that is in a similar situation to you that you think our services would be appropriate for or whatever? And there's a whole flow of conversation that can be followed through, that's very natural. You're not asking for something out of turn, and in most cases will deliver a result if it's followed up properly. And the issue, which we'll learn in a second, is that businesses just don't follow up. So just to reinforce once again, you know, these stats, just bear that in mind as you're looking at kind of all of this stuff. Um, and then to close on this one, the suggested actions here are around I would, I would strongly recommend running, however you do it, running a gap analysis. Again, just reinforce off the back of this, where are we putting our marketing or business development effort or whatever you want to call it within your, your organization. And then again, what client engagement process have we got in place? Whether that is we are sending out on MailChimp WAM, we are happy with that and that is just the way we're going to do it to we're going to pick up the phone and start some conversations because now actually we're thinking we haven't done that. So we're going to get some third party, maybe us, somebody else. We're going to get some third party to do something on our behalf. 
So again, it all just depends on the kind of return on investment calculations and all that kind of stuff as to what's the most appropriate way. I would just employ you to make sure you, if you can, speak to those customers. And that's the end of that one. Daniel, can I just say, um, quite thought provoking and um, Matt and I had a couple of kind of tic tac things and, and you did touch it on it at the end about the questions. And, you know, so often, um, if we're not careful as a business, we can think we make these widgets. So therefore, this is what we sell. And yeah. so therefore, if you don't need these widgets anymore, then I have lost you. Yeah. And um, particularly at this time, there are many businesses that are pivoting. And I think as a supplier, we can try and pivot with them. Now, we may not continue to be the direct supplier. They could... Yeah temporarily turn into an advocate whilst we signpost them to a supplier so in other words we're still giving them value yeah. but actually because we are now recommending them forward and um you know an example of this is actually the accountancy world which have very very much turned into the advisory world so yeah. from our hats they're actually doing all that we do but we kind of befriend them and work with them. I've yeah. recommended and signposted because that client and Matt and I were talking about um, uh, binning people and then lifetime yeah. value. And that yeah. client, if they still are a huge advocate, will either come back as a direct client one to one yeah. or they will do the same, not because it's reciprocal. It isn't, you know, mm. value to others doesn't have any, ties to it but just yeah. because they have felt the value to give, they could then recommend start through their chain back to you so yeah. um and it's asking good questions was what and you did touch yeah. on the end and i think at this time we've got to do much less talking the talking is where we're not actually able to hear the pivots that businesses yeah. are considering and it's asking those intelligent questions and the silent pauses and, and the follow-up. Well, what do you mean by that? How does that feel? What does it look like? So we get to it and that's where they feel the value. We pivot yeah. with them and they remain advocates, which keeps a lifetime value on that relationship. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think it is, as you say, um, Sarah, it's that interpretation um, from a sale. Talk about from a, you know, the if I can call it the low level salesperson going in to start with, and I appreciate that's probably doing them a massive disservice. They often don't listen. It's like, well, the client said they wanted this. Now they didn't want that because you didn't test out with them what they meant by that. Their interpretation of this particular phrase or service is probably completely different to everybody else's. So as you say, it's that kind of shared experience of trying to understand the, the fact find or the exploration or whatever it's called in terms of that process. What is the real problem, which I'm not going to talk about in a second, is what is the real problem we're actually solving? Because unless yeah, I understand I that, you're not, going to be mo yeah, you're not going to be motivated as a, as a prospect or even an existing client trying to sell you something new. A client can I, I, wouldn't only... limit, I wouldn't limit that to low-level salespeople. There's plenty of senior people that still cock up regularly. I was thinking on my feet, Matt, which is obviously dangerous for me at this time of the morning. And then I was, yeah, no, I agree. It's like we've, we've seen a situation where talking to business i was talking again different business yesterday um we've got our sales team on furlough let's say we're on 70 percent of our revenue hang on a minute we're on 70 percent of our revenue still and we haven't got a sales team in play do i want that overhead for that level of revenue and there's a serious discussion that goes on about but it's part of the pivot and the pivot yeah. is not always in in the activity sometimes it's a pivot in the mindset and i think at this time there are many um, businesses that know what they think they want and where they're struggling is they haven't grasped what they need and I think this is where we can help all of us as yeah. business owners and, and particularly you know those who've got large client bases the value is sharing the stories of what others are doing to help people realize what they need above what they want because they only know what they know if you don't know you don't know so and yeah. sometimes they they that they stick to what they know. This is what we need. This is what we need. I oh, know this is yeah. what we want. This is what we want. And they need someone to break that barrier down and go, actually, maybe this is what you need, which then means a pivot in mindset. Yeah. I mean, not slightly linked to that, but one of the, I suppose, more amusing stories 
and this was way before COVID, this was to, to almost two years ago, we did some work with a company that was, um, they sold chairs basically into conference centers. So they were a bulk seller of chairs. We're quite, there's a load of stuff that came out and said that a lot of your customers are asking for table, is it, and this is not a joke, a lot of your customers are asking for tables and coffee tables because you're putting stuff in, you're installing into hotel. Yeah, but we don't do coffee tables. Really? Okay. Do you not know anybody that does coffee tables? <laughs> and it's that whole kind of mindset that says, look, we're not saying that you as the supplier need to have all this inventory and this stuff, but go and find a referral partner or whatever strategic partner, whatever it is that can and take it from there. And the, you know, the advent of the internet clearly makes those relationships an awful lot easier because well, if I'm buying this product, I'm also interested in this product. It's quite a straightforward process. It is quite frustrating, but yeah, you're absolutely right, Sarah. Mike, was there anything on the chat log at all? No, not really. Apart, not apart really. From, <laughs> apart from, apart from, apart from uh, Matt saying bin number six. Mm. So uh, uh, I think Tom. Yeah, absolutely. One of the other. Sorry, can I just? It, one of the other worrying things that I've. It's you know, there's a lot of people. One of my biggest, I say, things I'm thinking about is. There's going to be a huge lack of productivity and there's going to be a huge lack of revenue that lots of companies are going to experience as we come out of COVID. And one of the one of the one of the real I think one of the real restricting points of that is it's not enough networking. When I say networking, I don't mean cheesy networking, but I mean people yeah. collaborating in groups like this, being online or or putting themselves out to actually connect and reconnect with people. And yeah. what a lot of people have done is they've gone head down into, oh, shit, I need to protect my business or I need to get things going. And they've not actually put it upon themselves to reconnect with their networks and they've not put it upon themselves to reconnect with whatever networking group, partnerships, influence and all those sorts of things. And all I would say is, is we've, all got to, we've all got to make a big point of getting – networking online in this kind of format or, or, or peer groups or anything else like that, because that's also a great source of the referral network as well in terms of generating yeah. revenue streams. Yeah, no, I agree, Matt, completely. And I think it's a question of finding those groups and doing it in the right way so that, you know, I'm talking to businesses and say, oh yeah, we're going to be back in face to face by the end of the year. I'm not convinced on that at all. Because we're all, we're all going to take it, well, personal view. We're going to take a view as that this works, to, to my mind, this kind of discussion, this network that we're, we're discussion we're having now. Clearly, it would be great to have a kind of a face to face environment, but ultimately, people are going to take a really strong view as to do I want to take the time and, and in quotes, potentially the risk of going into a group environment? And everyone's going to have their own personal view on that. Um, but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's, it's finding the right right groups to to be in and making sure that those are re-engaged with and i again, i was talking to again somebody the day before yesterday it's like you know i've spoken to people who just had literally had their head down well i can't go networking so therefore i can't do anything and it's like no that's a worry that's a real that's a real threat to lots of lots of small and mid-sized businesses yeah yeah and you've got as you say teams have been put on furlough and they literally have well they're not allowed in quotes they're not allowed the stuff they could have done potentially to, for their own self-improvement. Uh, anyway, let's not go there. <laughs> um, shall I, shall I carry on with the next one, Mike? I've sort of done all the time. I have a question to you, if I may. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you very much for answering the first one. Um, good. Ooh, that's good. Uh, I'll go a second one for you. Um, okay. I got the idea about uh, asking for a referral and being more, more direct about it. Um, but what about offering an incentive to a client? I suppose the question would be, is, is do, you, do you feel, and this would apply to anything, is, is what would motivate them to act? So mm. I've taken, a, again, this is just a, a thought, Thomas, I've, about, I've taken a service and I thought it was great, okay? Um, and I've told you it was great, and I said that I would recommend. So let's go, we've gone through that process. What more incentivized, incentivization do I need? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but often the very fact that I've had a good job and I'm giving somebody the gift of the introduction because I know that they've got a problem like I had and I can help them solve that problem by introducing yourself, that's good enough for me. 
okay, maybe. Or it could be, is it a financial reward directly to me or a credit on some future work? Maybe that might motivate me. Or is it, whatever this means, is it some sort of charitable, yeah, for every referral we get, we make a donation to water aid or whatever it might be. So I think it's what's appropriate. And again, it's probably worth another conversation to be honest about businesses often feel that it's the, the cash value maybe of the gift or the incentive or whatever it might be that makes the difference. And I think often it's just you know, people do want to try and do the right thing often. I think share the love a little bit in terms of I've had a great service. It solved my problem and I'd like to help somebody else. So it solved the same problem that I had. Does that answer the question? Ish. Okay. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. Ish. Ish. <laughs> Ish. It just Sometimes I feel like sometimes the clients, they need that little bit extra push. And, uh, and for me to start the conversation again about the, the same referral as a, Oh, yeah. would you be still willing to, re to, to recommend me to, to one of your, or whatever, uh, a business colleague or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, so just to, for, for, for me to recap that conversation with them is again, so, well, we could offer an incentive or something because my client, they still going to need to go out of the way yeah. to, to do that for me. And I do sell the high ticket item. So my item is not yeah. very cheap. So I could potentially give, I don't know, a reward or 100, 200 pounds or whatever it's going to be. Yeah, I think, I think again, it's, it's what's appropriate. I think, yeah, if you're in a position where it can be a credit, on i'm making an assumption it could be a credit on future work you haven't technically given anything away you've given away a bit of margin on some future work but you haven't got the cost of acquisition on that new client so that might be the way of doing it thomas are you familiar with the concept of tradables there's a there's a wonderful speaker called malcolm smith on negotiation and he has a concept called tradables, which we used extensively in our previous company. And it was very, very good to A, prevent giving away discounts, but also giving away referral type capability. So make a list of, of, of high, uh, sorry, of low cost items that you can provide, such as training, updates, or anything else like that, that could have a perceived high value in the eyes of the customer and use those as negotiation stances for when you either have been asked for a discount because you might not want to give a discount or um or in the event that you actually been passed a referral and you'd like to give somebody something back so have a list and we used to have our salespeople used to have a list on the inside cover of their books which was a list of their tradable items. It could be refresher training, update days, but these technique, a lot of them were opportunities to actually go and sell yeah. again. Yeah. Oh, what's I think the it's person, it... person who, who, who did the speech or who wrote the book? Malcolm Smith. I think you probably know him, don't you, Mike? No? No, I don't. I, don't I, I think I, I, I've, I think I've spoken to uh, you, Mike, about Malcolm Smith. You you mentioned it, Chris. Well, I'm uh, I've uh, I've not actually read his book. Okay, sorry, I'll shut up. No, no I mean I think it's it's a, a really val really valid point, Matt. Because from from the point of view, you so say you can't once you've given the money away, you can't get it back again, and they'll they'll grab that discount potentially on future work anyway. So you're absolutely right. If if there's something else that they're going to perceive as high value, and it's kind of question of working out what those things might be. Because the, the, the ultimate assumption, again, going down this kind of new client inquiry bit, is I've got to chase it down on price. Well, no, that might not be the issue. As you say, it could be training or support or something or payment terms or something that's not actually having to give away hard cash. Isn't the art of trading, never give away, always trade. I worked with a dentist who did that with hygienist appointments, exactly the principle you said, very, very low cost high yeah. value to the patients, but it was a trade um, because of the perceived value of free, or we yeah. were always taught in the speaking world, never say free, say you have it at no cost. Yes. Um, and I have it all the time with my pro bono stuff. Um, it's amazing how people, um, you know, in their heads there's an adjustment because it hasn't cost them anything. They don't value it the same. Um, oh, no, they don't. <laughs> it's the human stuff. Right, I'm conscious of the time, so I will crack on if that's okay. Um, generating new inquiries. We have been touching on this, ironically, and I think the issue here is that um, I'm sure we're all all over this, but often 
yeah, our assessment is based on looking on someone's website because that's the easiest thing for us to look at. And someone actually mentioned it, I think earlier on, is it's not clear what problem I'm solving as the supplier for you. And therefore, from the point of view of this relationship that we're trying to build, how is that kind of working in terms of, can you, you know, okay, we're either going to move away to, you know, from a problem, we all want problem solving. Do we understand what those problems are and how are you going to make my life better? And if you think about it in the context of looking at a website, which I'm you know, equating to a written brochure or whatever it might be, or an email communication. Websites are often the easiest thing for obviously us to assess, but also the thing for a uh, you know, potential prospect to assess. Is, is how is this going to make my life better? Do I want to know more about it? And am I prepared to spend? And how am I being taken on that journey? And when we run website assessment, it's often just the wrong material and it's not taking me through this journey in any particular way. So whoever can do this the easiest, and as Sarah Matt was saying, not down to price it's about can you make my life as easy as possible and i'm actually prepared to pay a premium in most cases for that if i feel that i'm going to guarantee i'm going to get a result so in terms of that problem solving and creating a sales funnel again i'm sure we're all all over this but just this kind of process of a stepwise thing is uh, what's our one liner liner how are we making this potential new we're now talking about a new prospect or in my mind i'm also talking about potential new service to an existing client is how is this going to make their life better is the is the website as the kind of central point for new client inquiries is that really working what kind of lead generator are we producing yeah what's our giveaway giveaway in terms of in, in return for something i.e., your email address or whatever it might be in terms of uh, return for some sort of detail what are we prepared to give away yeah it's a kind of, kind of classic high value or perceived high value pdf how is that being built into, for example, CRM system, email marketing, whatever it might be? And ultimately, are we actually getting to the point where we're asking the client to make a commitment? And a lot of these seem to fall over because the sales effort never actually asks that final question is around, do you actually want to buy this stuff? However, it's put across, they don't, well, we haven't sold, that's because you haven't bloody asked for the order in a lot of cases. So that's one one kind of concept on there. The other element is this kind of whole area of the lead time. Now, this could be massively, if we're send, selling aeroplanes, probably not at the moment, but if we're selling aeroplanes, it's going to be long or trains or whatever it might be. But there's a lead time here. And do have we got the pinch points in, in terms of understanding our points of connection? And often we have this discussion around, okay, yeah, I've got a new inquiry that's come in. I've followed it up. Um, they haven't responded and now I now I think I'm being a bit of a pain by following it up and therefore I'm going to not follow it up because in my head that's not the right thing to do and this is how a whole loop of you know depression goes on because it never gets followed up properly so this whole kind of concept of how often should we be making contact well okay well how often does our product get sold so you know very simple graph from me um, What's our per typical purchase frequency? Is it daily, weekly, monthly? Is it just ad hoc? Is it distress? You know, we've got this whole area here of kind of the client attrition line, but also that should start to give us an indication of how often we might be wanting to engage with this particular customer. So if we start to look at the kind of irresistible customer relationship model, which again is an old, yeah, you, know, you can Google it. It's an old model. It's been around for ages, but it still stands, despite the fact that this was probably written way before the internet. Um, and those methods of communication, which is how many points of communication do we really need to have before we're kind of top of mind with that client? Now, clearly, if it's a distressed purchase and something's broken down in the house and I need it today, I've got to replace it today, then all of this kind of goes out the window slightly, but I've still got the, the value of the internet to kind of at least seek some opinion quite quickly, even if I haven't got a chance to do a massive amount of research. And the clues in the color coding, it's around about seven, eight, nine points of contact need to be made. And what we're tending to find, and again, when you're sat in the group doing this kind of as a workshop uh, environment, people can kind of start furiously nodding, certainly if they're running sales teams, which is, well, I rang them, the inquiry comes in, I'm allocated to follow up, I, cont I tried to contact them, uh, they didn't ring me back and I've given up. Okay, is that being tracked anywhere on a CRM system? And if you start to run through this, is that, you know, after four stroke five points of contact, most businesses... Have kind of given up because they assume that that prospect is no longer interested in that service 
well, we're all really, really busy and weeks fly by and stuff gets in the way and other priorities come along, same for us as it would be for them. So is there a CRM, any kind of follow-up process, whether it's just a list written down somewhere or a list on a spreadsheet, is there something somewhere that forces this follow-up? Um, and that's one thing I would kind of advocate if, if a business isn't already doing, is just making sure these calls are followed because you never quite know when you're going to hit them at the right time. You build this model up and ultimately you're turning around and saying to a business, but how often are you making these points of contact and what is forcing these points of contact? And the example I gave you earlier on was quarry comes in, we go and do a site survey. Uh, we do a whole load of work around that site survey and you know, do a proposal and then we just wait. There were no follow up points of contact. So unless the client actually rang and placed an order, they assume they'd lost it. It's like, well, where's the quick phone call just to check you received it? Uh, quick email to check you received it. Quick email to check that well, now you've had a chance to look at it. Have you got any questions? Would you like to have a quick look at this installation video or something? There's a whole bunch of stuff that they should have been doing as an organization and quite often we'll sit there off the back of the client engagement work and say, look, what does this roadmap look like from a potential prospect onboarding process from they don't know you to bring them on as a client and where are the pinch points within that? So there's that concept to kind of follow through. And then the other bit that I said I would cover off is this whole area of social proof, which yeah, you guys may be familiar with this. Um, if, if what I'm saying is kind of of interest, you can either list, listen to Audible for 10 hours or six minutes, or you can go and Google it and listen to a 12 minute video. Um, if you go Google Caldini, um, Science of Persuasion, I would, again, we can send the link through if you've not watched that video. It's been around for a while, but it still stands. And I think for most businesses, you'd pull something out of that, that, that you would consider to be useful. Um, but just to kind of give you the headlines on this. I need to be able to, so I'm now thinking about, I'm looking at, I'm now a new prospect looking at a business's website because I've been, maybe I've been referred and I actually just want to do a little bit of research myself or I've done some Googling and they happen to have come up or I'm trying to solve my particular problem. Are you demonstrating that you have solved the issue that I've got for people like me? Have people like me seen value in your service? I don't really want to spend my first part of the website reading all about company history and how it was founded by my grandfather and blah, blah, blah. That might be really useful and interesting stuff and relevant for the heritage of the product. But right now, I just want to know, can you help me out? Do you understand my problem? And often when you go onto a business's website, it's not, it's not going down that particular route. It's too generic. And the acid test for this for me is copy and paste the text, give it to somebody to read and say, can you tell me what that business does and what problem they solve and what sector they're in? Because if, if you can't do it without looking at all the branding and such like that, yeah, what sort of chance has Google got? Social proof is about removing resistance to purchase as well, because you're making my decision making a lot easier because you're demonstrating to me that you help people like me solve the problem that I have. And you're providing that evidence to me in terms of feeling comfortable about making this decision, because I don't want to embarrass myself by making the wrong decision. Now, clearly, if I've been referred in, I've got less of an issue there because I'm taking on trust that the person who referred me in yeah, understand the issue I have and therefore is prepared to follow through on it. So what we're trying to get across is empathy. You know, do you understand from my perspective what my issue is? Are you capable? Can you demonstrate capability on this site, on this brochure in your emails that you actually you are able to do what you say you do? You do it consistently and it's not just a one, you know, you haven't just managed to do it one off got a good testimonial from somebody and living off the back of that. And I would also say, you know, are you current? So not that you know, we were a great company founded by my father, blah, blah, blah. We'd be great customer service. We've got a few testimonials from three years ago and actually now we've changed the business. We're not actually as good as we used to be. And I need to make sure that this is current. It's a shame you're still in business for this particular service. So the way that I would suggest you potentially, again, we can send these slides around, but I would call this a kind of bit of an audit around social proof, which is, is the proposition clear? It's kind of one liner. What do we do? Um, yeah, the elevator pitch, whatever it might be. 
what accreditations are appropriate within our marketplace that give me that extra credibility, which are kind of the baseline. If I haven't got those, then I shouldn't be operating. Testimonials and case studies that are relevant to each service rather than, okay, great. If we've got some, that's fantastic. But yeah, ideally they should be relevant and specific to each service and ideally specific to each type of client within that service, because I want to know that you've solved a problem for somebody like me with the same issue that I've got. Guarantee, there's a whole raft of stuff around guarantees. Um, again, going back to the point about not giving money away, et cetera, there's a whole bit around, you know, businesses may be prepared to offer the same levels of guarantee, but often businesses don't talk about it on their website. And therefore the one that does talk about it on their website or in their marketing material is more likely to pick up the business because they feel more overt about it. Don't hide behind guarantees. You know, there's a, there's a massive power power to those if they're, they're kind of properly constructed. This whole bit about social presence. Now, this isn't me saying um, we need to be prevalent on absolutely every kind of social platform because that would be non impossible, but it's about the business deciding what it wants to be on, what's appropriate to it, and making sure that's up to date. Because what we don't want is to be going off to Facebook and LinkedIn profiles that are not up to date. In my mind, you're better off not having them if they're not going to be kept current. So therefore choose which is most appropriate to your particular market. Same applies to things like news, which is, you know, again, you look at, yeah, I look at a site, we look through it, go, okay, am I seeing all these things on there? Do I feel comfortable that that's the kind of right supplier? I'm not going to read all their news, but I might click on there and say, well, when was the last news article posted? Does that give me a, does that make me feel more or less confident about their ability to service me, whatever it might be? In terms of the website technical aspects itself, again, you know, would we, would any of us buy from an e-commerce site that hasn't got a padlock in the top left-hand corner? Um, because we're now kind of sufficiently educated in the main that that's appropriate. Does it, does it technically uh, make sense in terms of the way that things operate? Can I read it on my phone? It's all of these sorts of things. We'll start to give an underlying view to somebody of how switched on this particular business is. So you can, yeah, you can kind of do a self audit on this and say, well, how, how comfortable do I feel around all of these areas? Yeah, how are we using FAQs? Uh, lots of businesses, there's a massive opportunity in there because we can kind of say what we like in terms of what the, we're not going to put a page on a website slagging off a competitor. Well, we might, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't advocate it. There's no reason why we couldn't put an FAQ up saying, yeah, well, someone's asked us what the comparison is between our service offering and their service offering, and here's our straight answer. So FAQs are a massive opportunity, I think, in terms of being able to build content and credibility, both from a visitor perspective and also from a, from a Google perspective, which is still highly relevant. And then the last part of this is around um, your, your availability. Right, I get it. You're credible. You've done this job before. Great stuff. Okay. Are you actually available to do this for me now? Um, and again, certainly currently with kind of the COVID stuff, there's a lot of stuff on, you know, is this product available? Is this service available? I've had to dig quite far in there. And now I'm finding that it's not. So again, again, the, depending on your product or service, maybe making that a bit more obvious in terms of whether you're ready to do business now, whether you've got a waiting list or whatever it might be. So yeah, just one quick example on that. We were working with a corporate car hire company and I said, look, you know, competitive market, products are all very similar to Bob. They're all the same to each other. And I suspect there's a lot of charlatans in this market where they'll absolutely sting you when you bring the product back in terms of damage or whatever it might be. So we've done research with you guys. We know you're a good company. You, you know, you look after your clients. I said, but there is nothing on your website that tells me that you've ever sold, ever leased a car to anybody or that you've got any happy customers. So if I went onto your website and there was a counter up there saying, so far this year, we have leased this number of cars. And so far this year, our trust pilot rating is this. And your whatever it was, was 200 pound a month. And I go to another website and it's 10 quid a month cheaper, but I can't see that evidence. Am I prepared to take the risk go with the cheaper supplier when I'm seeing this evidence in front of me. And quite often businesses just kind of forget. We have got the evidence, but just don't show it to anybody. So just in terms of that session there, we've got, I would recommend, we'll send the link through to Science Persuasion. 
I think you can use that kind of grid to look at your kind of social proof and how that balances up. Now, it's not about kind of, well, your theoretical score of 10 out of 10, but it's more a question of how do we compare perhaps to our next nearest competitor? Because as long as we're doing marginally better than them, then that might be acceptable for the moment. Uh, we can keep chasing perfect, but we can keep chasing perfect and we will never get there. Then I would kind of review the sales collateral off the back of that and say, like, are we really utilizing all this material that we've got? And a real big thing for me would be whether it's whether the CRM system is a paid for system, whether it's a spreadsheet or whether it's some post-it notes, just have something that's making sure that you're following up. You know, if you've had a series of phone calls, you know, I'm, I'm a bit anal with this, but you know, if I've had a series of phone calls today, I will at least make sure I've finished by writing a note saying, when am I next going to follow this up on the diarise and make sure that we do it. There's a whole bunch of stuff around that one as well. Um, I'm really conscious of the time, so I'm going to stop there and say I'm done, I think, Mike. I'm just conscious of your 9.30. It's 9.28 according to that. That's, cool. That's all right, because I think, uh, you know, some people might leave, but if some people might, might well have questions because it's a very... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay to hang on, but uh, I was conscious of some, some people have probably got other... Uh, very, very relevant uh, topic and say, uh, you know, I can just looking at people's, uh, people's body language. So, uh, no, I, I can see that everybody was interested in it. So, fantastic. So if there's any questions at all that you guys have got, I said I'll liaise with Mike um, just in terms of, again, if, you, if you're if you interested and in, want some of the links I've referred to, well, I guess, Mike, is it, are we able to sell and send an email out to everybody just with those links on? Absolutely. Yeah, no problem at all. All right. So I'll, I'll liaise with you and we'll yeah, get that okay. sent round. Pippa normally sends the, an email out tomorrow, the day after. So... Uh... One last thing I was going to um, also add to that link is, Mike, if it's okay with us, just going to flag the event that you attended a couple of weeks ago, which we're repeating with Metro Bank next week. Yes, definitely. Um, I haven't got a slide up for it, but we we ran a, Mike was involved in it as well. For, so we inquire and Metro Bank and um, Virtual Finance Director, who Mike's involved with as well. Uh, we ran a webinar which talked about, you know, if you're still looking to apply for funding, um, what are the banks and the funders really looking to see? If you've got funding and need a business plan, um, what should you really be looking at? Which we have slightly touched on some of that today. And then also I, I'm doing a session there kind of on elements of this around client engagement. So if it's okay, we'll, we'll send the link. That's a, another kind of hour and a half session that's on Wednesday next week, uh, done as a Zoom. Um, I'll liaise with Pippa, Mike, and we'll get the link out sent out for that one as well. Uh, but if you guys want any follow up with me, um, I'll make sure you've got my contact details. But I'm happy to hang around if you've got any questions. Yes, and we just just to echo what uh, Daniel just said, we we run a series of uh, well, will be weekly workshops. Tend to be Thursdays at two p.m. And uh, next week is actually going to be a Wednesday at two p.m. Uh, where Dan's going to be looking at the client acquisition side that we've just been doing in one hour. So just taking that side in particular in more detail. So uh, again, it's available free of charge. If you uh, just go through our website, um, go through our upcoming events page and just uh, log on there. So um, next uh, next BBF, just while people are, I know some people are desperate to go, is actually um, by a lady called Charlie Wyman, really interesting actually on the uh, use of LinkedIn, making sure that um, I identify your marketing strategy, but then where does LinkedIn fit into your marketing strategy? So well worth listening to. So uh, you'll get the details of that uh, coming up. It's something like the third, it's the third Wednesday rather than the second Wednesday of September. So we'll send you those details on that. So any questions for Daniel, any, any more um, issues that anybody wants to raise? So we, you know, you're more than welcome if you want to attend the um, um, next week's session on um, Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. And uh, otherwise, uh, if we've got no more questions, uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, no problem. I always, you're welcome. I always enjoy nice to meet you all. <laughs> thank you. And we'll, we will share the uh, we will share the slides and uh, and your contact details on there. So uh, and if anybody wants to have an audit 
of their web. Um, Daniel did a, an audit of our website. Needless to say, uh, I shared it with our uh, website team, who were very defensive. So uh... naturally, naturally. <laughs> now, and what Mike's referring to is just you know from a just having done this for a long enough time, just looking at it from a client or prospect's perspective, and just giving you a view. Um, I say it's a personal opinion, but if you you want to get involved in that, we'll we'll, we'll offer that up as well. No problem. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks everybody, and uh, have a. It's going to be another in a scorching day in the uh, southeast. So, uh, hope you got your shorts on. Get out there, Max. Enjoy get out. On, get out on your bike, Max. Uh, I'm going to the gym in a minute. <laughs> I need the air con. <laughs> could I? Sorry, could I just ask? Could somebody let me have the name of the book, the Malcolm Smith book? Um, it's Tradables. I'll, I'll I'll look it up for you. Something it's something to do with Tradables. Yeah, there's, there's, sorry, there's video, there's video stuff. I, I, I think he has written books, but he's a speaker. Oh, it's on, a, on video, it's lovely. I'll touch, I'll touch base with you, Matt, and on that, then we'll, we'll share those details. Okay. <laughs> Chris, Chris has probably got details as well, actually. Mike. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. All right, thanks very much. Thanks, okay, Thank guys. Until next time, bye. 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 Okay, bye.